lot of this isn't going to make sense to you, and I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to start at the beginning with the house. I lived here until I was 11, but I wasn't allowed inside half the rooms. I hadn't been back since my brother Lewis's funeral. In her will, my mother left me a key, but didn't tell me what it unlocked. Maybe she thought I'd know, or... She thought the mystery would be enough to bring me back. The truth is, even after I inherited the house, I never thought I'd come back to it. But now I had questions about my family that only the house knew the answers to. The woods around the house have always been uncomfortably silent. As if they're about to say something, but never do. The house was exactly like I remembered it the way I'd been dreaming about it. As a child, the house made me uncomfortable in a way I couldn't put into words. Now, as a 17-year-old, I knew exactly what those words were. I was afraid of the house. Crawling through the doggy door used to be a lot easier when I was 11. For the first time in years, I felt like I was home. Nothing in the house looked abnormal. There was just too much of it, like a smile with too many teeth. After Milton disappeared, Mom sealed up all the bedrooms. Then Edie retaliated and drilled peepholes. I spent a lot of time playing in Great Uncle Walter's room. Lewis told me there were secret passages, but I never believed him. Turns out, my mom was really good at keeping secrets. Now it was time to find out what my mom had been afraid of. Reading this, Maybe it sounds like I had a plan, but I had no idea what was behind that door. Just like I had no idea where all this was going to lead. December 13th, 1947. Dear Diary, I'll be gone soon, but I wanted to tell somebody about what's going to happen. It started when Mom sent me to bed without dinner. I woke up and I was starving, so I looked around for something to eat. My Halloween candy was all gone. The gerbil food was dry, but I didn't mind it. I kept eating and eating. Then I heard chirping outside my window. It was a barn swallow going back to her nest. I reached out for her. And suddenly, I was a cat. I tried to be quiet, but the bird was really scared. I jumped and I almost got her. Now I was up in the big tree. I gobbled her up. And suddenly, I was an owl. First, all I heard was the wind. Then I heard little teeth nibbling in the grass.
rabbits. I imagined his face looking up and seeing mine through my talons. I swallowed him up and I didn't chew one bit. Then I flew off to find something bigger. A mama rabbit. She was almost too big to carry. I started choking, but I couldn't stop eating. And suddenly, I was a shark. I rolled off a cliff and into the ocean. Now, I was hungrier than ever. I wanted fat, juicy seals. I tore off her flipper and it tasted really good. Everything had changed. Now I was a monster and I smelled people everywhere. I was big, but I moved real quiet. After the last passenger, I was still hungry. And across the water, I smelled something new. Something I had to have, so I swam towards it. I slithered onto the sand, and the good smell went into an old pipe. Closer and closer. All of my stomach started growling. And suddenly, I was me again. I'm not sure if I believed all of that, but I'm sure Edie would have. This will be obvious later, but my mom never told me any of these stories. Edie would have, but mom didn't like bringing up the past. Though, when we adopted a stray kitten, she was the one who named it Molly. I spent a lot of time in Great Grandma Edie's room. Even in her 90s, sometimes Edie seemed a lot younger than my mother. The only trace Grandpa Sam's first wife Kay left on the house was the pink bathroom. There's a secret in this bathroom. 
It's in the last place you would look. It isn't in the cupboard. It's hidden in this book. I knew Grandpa Sam had a twin, and that he never talked about him. Passages were a pretty tight fit. They'd obviously been built for smaller hands and bellies. Growing up, I always thought of Barbara as a child star. Of all the stories people wrote about Barbara's death, I'm surprised Edie saved this one. Oh, Jack here with another ghastly tale inspired by America's most unfortunate family. I'm calling it The Surprise Ending of Barbara Finch. As a child star, Barbara was famous for her scream. Now at 16, she was all washed up has been. But in a lucky break, she'd been asked to perform her signature scream at a local convention for monster movie fans. It was just the boost her career needed. Unfortunately, her scream hadn't aged well. <laughs> Getting better. I think you just need the right motivation. Her biggest fan and current boyfriend, Rick, was about to demonstrate when... Now that was a great scream. It was Barbara's father, Sven. He'd slipped into a table saw and had to be rushed to the emergency room. So Barbara got stuck babysitting her youngest brother, Walter. Her convention comeback was canceled. Okay, I'm hearing frustration, but I'm not hearing terror. What if I tried... A gang of hoodlums and Halloween masks have been terrorizing Orcas Island tonight. Police are urging residents to... That came from the basement. You're right. Also, I loved your delivery on that. Why is your basement door locked? Because my dad likes making puzzles in secret passages. There's a key hidden in the music box. The secret is to keep winding and winding until finally, the key pops out. Thanks, babe. I'll be back in a sec. 20 minutes later, Rick hadn't returned. So Barbara went to look for him, right on cue. She reached for the music box. And as she wound the key, she listened for Rick. But the house was silent. She found Rick's crutch and imagined the worst. The gang's leader is the infamous Hookman killer, Dr. Carl Hamill, who impaled and then ate his family Both ten years ago tonight. And grew still. <gasps> oh dear! Barb, relax. I was just trying to scare you to help you find your scream. Well, I'm not scared, Rick. I'm furious. Then act furious. All I'm getting from you now is that you're hurt and confused and you're... She threw him out. 
But she kept a little something to remember him by. Barb, have you seen my other crutch? And she was still holding it when she fell asleep watching the late, late picture show. Hours later... Barbara! Walter, what's going on up there? Ah! Okay, I'm coming up. But if this is a trick, you're dead, Walter. Orcas Island Police describe the man as six feet tall, with a steel hook for a hand. Residents are urged to lock all doors and windows and notify the police of any suspicious activity. Barbara turned, saw the hook man, and was speechless. He was quite smashing. <laughs> Played her part beautifully. Molly's door hadn't been opened in years. The hinges groaned. He wasn't moving, but she sensed the story might not be over yet. Listened for his breathing, but all she heard was <gasps> at the door. She heard whispering. It was coming from inside the house. <gasps> oh dear. Surprise her. For Barbara, it was a dream come true. Then she saw what kind of monsters they were, and she realized what was about to happen. She was going to be famous. And with her final breath, Barbara Finch gave the performance of her life. I wasn't there myself, but I hear Barbara was magnificent. Poor girl. She had a taste for stardom. But unfortunately, so did her fans. Of course, the police blamed it all on poor Rick, who disappeared the same night. And little Walter? Hiding under his bed the whole time. He took it all pretty hard, but that's another story. As for Barbara, tucked inside the music box is all they ever found of her. Her ear. Now that's what I call a real eerie tale. Edie told me all Barbara wanted was to be remembered, as absurd as that comic was. Maybe what Edie saw was a happy ending. I guess now I know why Mom doesn't like me playing with the music box.
I saw Edie sneak down to the basement once, carrying packages. I thought maybe she was hiding presents. It turned out she was hiding a lot more than that. I remember asking mom once about where Walter had gone. She said after Barbara died, he got as far away as he could. If there's a pattern in all these stories, I think it's that none of us has gotten very far. Maybe she was afraid I'd end up like Walter. But if she never told me about an uncle under the house, I can only imagine what else she was hiding. I don't want to make the same mistakes she made, trying to bury something that's still alive. Now that there's only one of us left, or maybe two, I thought it was time I heard the stories for myself and found out what happened to everyone else. But now I'm worried the stories themselves might be the problem. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. I don't know if I should even be writing this. Maybe it'd be better if all this just died with me. But I thought you should know about your family. And the history you're a part of. Though to be honest, I feel as lost as you probably do right now. I think the people in these stories believed them for what that's worth. And when you look at the house, that history of imagination and stubbornness and madness, any of it seems possible. I think we've been surrounded by death for so long, we've just gotten used to it. What kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house? It's embarrassing for me to admit this, but the pet cemetery may be more uncomfortable than the human one. Three of the gerbils are mine, and two had been my fault. Sven built the house, but it was Edie who designed the I'm cemetery. I'm sure Odin's monument had been Edie's idea. My mom was always trying to move on, but for Edie, the past never went away. I wish I could ask my mom now. Part of me thinks this is what she wanted all along. For me to come back someday. And find everything out for myself. But looking back on it now... If she told me there was going to be so much climbing, I never would have come when I was 22 weeks pregnant. I never met Grandpa Sam, but 
I think he and my mom had a lot in common. They were both pretty intense. My mom moved up to the loft after her brothers died. At the time, it was as far away as she could get. I can't imagine what it was like for her to My mom moved to India a week after graduation and got a job teaching English. Louis was born a year later. When my dad died, I don't think mom knew where else to go. I'm sure Edie was happy to have her back. The house had to get a little bigger, but Edie was used to that. And for a while, things were good, almost normal, but it didn't last. The beginning of the end was Milton's 10th birthday, when Edie gave him a castle. Lewis's room smelled very, very familiar. That part of him lived on. I wish we'd stayed. What happened that night had been coming for a long time. Maybe it should have come sooner. But it had to end one way or another. All that's left now is to tell you about that last night. That whole last day, Edie just watched us pack and didn't say a word until supper when she raised her glass and said, To our final night together, and all our final nights apart. Grandma, you know what I said about alcohol. Some of your medications are very Edith, specific. I left a present for you in the hallway. Why don't you go open it? The grown-ups have to argue now. I'm sorry, you're right. We're all leaving tomorrow. Let's just enjoy our last- I'm not leaving. Edith, you're excused. The power had been shut off that morning, but Edie always had plenty of candles. When my mom sailed the library, I don't think she knew about the other entrance, or that Edie had a key to it. you're afraid of isn't going to end when you leave the house. Edith has a right to know these stories. My children are dead because of your stories. I think it's best if Edith and I leave tonight. We'll have the nursing home send a van for you in the morning. Okay? Dear Edith, there's so many stories I wish I could tell you, but there's only time for one. This is about what happened on the night you were born. That night, the tide went way, It was way the first out. and last time I ever saw the old house aground. There'd been an earthquake out in the middle of the ocean. 
They called it the lowest tide in a thousand years. God, it smelled awful. You know, I've seen that house every day of my life. But I never thought I'd go back to it. When the fog rolled in, I lost my way. I got turned around. I started seeing things, things I'd forgotten had ever existed. things came back to me. Or maybe I came back to them. Things I can't explain, but that I need you to try and... Edith, what are you doing in here? It's mine. Edith! Mom, you're gonna rip it! Let go! I kicked and screamed, but Mom dragged me to the car, and I never saw Great Grandma Edie again. The next morning, the van came to pick her up, but she was already gone. After that, we moved around a lot. We both tried to make the best of it. A few years went by. My mom didn't like to talk about it. But she started getting sick a lot. <coughs> the rest happened pretty quickly. She got better for a while. And then she didn't. And then I was alone. The last finch left alive. Until I found out about you. I'm still not sure what to tell you about all this. If we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes and appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. This journal was supposed to be for you, but now I hope you'll never see it. I just want to meet you and tell you all these stories myself, but I guess if you're reading this now, Things didn't work out that way. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck.